a friend put up a, a post this week that I printed out. Sometimes friends put up posts and think, man, that was just spot on. I'm going to leave some names out so you don't know who it is, but I'm going to generally read the post. This person woke up early in the morning to one of their children and scooped them up and cuddled them, played with them for a little bit, and then passed them on to one of their other children. The son came up and went back down for a morning nap. When they woke up thinking about everyday tasks ahead of them, mules, homeschooling, diapers, house cleaning, house projects, etc. And though they just had a nap, they were tired. But then they remembered Noah. God gave Noah instructions and told him to build an ark. God would take care of the animal roundup, the rains, the drying of the land. Noah just had to build the ark. And this person said, you know what? God's given me health after cancer, a husband I adore, called us both to surrender our fertility, filled our hearts and arms with more children than we can even hold, overflowing. So I slid out of bed because I had received my instructions. All I have to do is build the ark today. God will do the rest. I thought, man, that was a good post. If you're waking up thinking about all the stuff you got to take care of, stop it. Just get up and do what God tells you to do. And today, the first thing was get out of bed. And then there'll be more. God will give you instructions as it comes. But I know what hinders a lot of people from getting out is, is the process. The process is hard. Like, there's so much to do. And I totally understand that. But it doesn't give us an excuse. And in fact, as believers, it's how we stand out the most when the process doesn't destroy us. And today's two-part message, I want to talk about this process, preparation. We're only going to be able to get through half of what it was really on my heart for the week. And so it's good. I think it'll kind of work out well, especially with community today, as I said. So there really does come a time in life when everyone's going to get tested. And for my friend who put this post up, it was that morning. It was probably a daily thing. When you're a parent of a lot of kids, when you have eight, my wife and I have eight, this person has 10, so you're probably a little closer to figuring out who it was now but they're a great writer, and I love their posts. You get tested a lot. You get tested in life. And there's so many times that Jesus has a test for you all the time. Right? You've heard if, if your life is just going smooth and easy, you're probably not doing anything for the Lord. And people don't like to hear that because if that's you, and you're like, well, my life's easy. And people are like, well, you must not be doing anything for the Lord. You're like, don't say that about me. You don't know my life. Well, if all you're claiming is life is easy and smooth sailing all day, that's not how it works. The enemy gets after you when you're serving the Lord. That's just the bottom line. And it's biblically supported. It's true. You can look wherever you want. When you're serving Jesus Christ, life gets hard. We know that. It's full of troubles and tribulations because the world is in love with itself and its doings and its selfishness and all the ways of itself. And we as Christians are to be in love with, with things that are Christly accomplishments, selflessness, generosity, sacrifice, Trust and hope in all redemptive things. This is who we are. Philippians 4, 8, right, tells us, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This is the life of a believer. This is what we look at. But the world says, who's to blame? Why is everything going wrong? Prep for the worst. Look out for numero uno. Right? This is the world. So if you're not having tension, it must be because you're not looking at whatever things are lovely and of good rapport and pure and upright because those are hard to look at. Let's be honest, they're hard to look at. And when we look at them, the enemy sneaks in through the news report, through your neighbor, through your boss, through whatever, and puts something bad back in front of you again. But all, all the time that these things happen, God is prepping us for something bigger. When, when the bad comes, God is always prepping I would actually written my notes sometimes, maybe, but really the truth is all the time. When bad comes, God is prepping us. God is growing us. God is preparing us. The good news, church, Jesus has this penchant for giving us the answers first, right? That's how he works. That's what I love about serving God. He doesn't just put the blinders on and say, go for it. I hope it all works out because we wouldn't do it. We barely do it now and we know the answer. But Jesus is really good at saying, listen, I'm going to, give you the answer first. Imagine it like this. You go to class, you walk in, your professor's up front, and he, he says, all right, we're going to have a test today class, and there's paper on your desk. So you can turn it over and look at it right now if you want. And he gets out the chalk, and he goes up front, and he, number one, and he writes an answer. Number two, x equals four. Number three, y divided by x equals a. And he starts putting all these answers. And you know, what are you doing? So I'm putting the answers up first. You're all going to get the test right. The answers are there. You can't fail. Well, why are we doing this? Because here's what I do want. I don't care about the answer. I already know the answers. I'm writing them on the board so you know the answers. 
but I'm going to give you a piece of scrap paper, and what you have to do is write out the process of how you got the answer, because that's what I'm going to grade you on. And all of a sudden, we see Jesus, don't we? Jesus, listen, I already told you I win. I already told you you win. Well, what I'm curious about is if we're all sitting in the same classroom for the same semester, for the same 45 minutes, why is it that we have so much trouble all using the same tools to get to the same spot when we all know the same answer? So Jesus wants to train us up a little bit today. He wants to say, hey, there's a better, there's a better answer. When the test is over, he says, we'll go over the process again, and we'll go over it again, and we'll go over it again, because the process is the most important part of the journey, not the, the destination. We already know where we're headed. Right, believer? We already know where we're headed, but how we get there. That's the hard part to life. The reminder from God that we win, right? It's open book test. Cheat sheets. Here's your cheat sheet. I don't mind. Here's all of the answers. If you went to college, you know, open book tests were not only my favorite, because generally you passed them, hopefully, but they're real life. That's what we were learning in college. Listen, you don't go to your boss and he's like, I need you to do this plan. And guess what? You can't use a calculator. <laughs> what? See, I just need to know you know how to use the calculator. I need you to get the answer right. So we look at Joshua real quick before we get in today's message. Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua, he called the 12 men who he had appointed from the children of Israel. One man from every tribe. Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come. Saying, what do these stones mean to you? You shall answer them. The waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Sets up a memorial. Brothers and sisters in Christ here this morning. I'm here to tell you, just as two plus two always equals four, we already know that. It's never going to change. But as we teach our little kids, it, but how are you getting there? How did you add two and two? Did you do it in your head? Some of us do it in our head. Did you have to write it out? Did you have to count on your fingers? What was your process? The answer is not ever going to change. But what did you do to get there? How did you remember? And when you got there, what did you use as a marker like Joshua? God told him, pick up 12 stones, build this altar. And then when generations come and say, what are these stones? Tell them about the victory of God. So listen, God's victory is victory. It's unbeatable. You can't lose. These stones reminded us of the last victory. And they'll remind us of the next victory. I want to learn from the methods of Jesus how we, in the hard part of life, because listen, the, we're, the final outcome of salvation, we're, we're good, we already know that. We've already been reborn. We're marked and we're sealed. The hard part is today until tomorrow until the end of time, right? Sanctification. This is the journey. This is where we're at all the time. You're already saved. You've already been reborn. You're good. But now there's the journey. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment as we read through this next portion of the Gospel of Matthew. Help us just to see what you have set up for us, Lord God, and why the memorial stone of communion is so important. We love you, Jesus. Pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us this morning. In your precious name, we all said, amen. Amen. So Matthew 26, if you haven't turned there already, go ahead real quick. Matthew 26, starting at verse 26. We're going to start trekking through the rest of this chapter. Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the many for remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So remember, Jesus is in this spot. We were looking at a couple weeks ago before we did the essentials salvation last week. We were talking about Jesus is on the way to the cross. He's in this resolute attitude for redemption at all cost. This is where Jesus is headed. This is going to be a great test moment of faith that the Lord is going to have for us. He's going to 
set up this time. He's already provided the final answer, but he wants the class, right? He wants the disciples, really more specifically Peter and, of course, us, because we're reading it today, to learn the process of arriving at the correct answer. How are we going to finally end up at the end with the right way? And so we're going to start with and look at today the institution of communion, of taking the cup, of taking the bread. We're going to see this stone of remembrance that Jesus sets up, right? Because in other gospels, he comes and he says, it, this do in remembrance of me, right? As often as you think of me, as often, as often as. Is there a time limit? Is there a number? Our church does it once a month. Some churches do it every week. Some do it every other week. Listen, as often as we remember, this is what we do. But we're going to go beyond just corporate church setting. I want to look at what Jesus is talking about. The, the fellows here have lived their whole life under the understanding of the Old Testament. right? Rules, regulations. They've had to understand and, and to celebrate these at least three yearly festivals. The Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Booths, the Passover, Unleavened Bread. Right? They're, they're always having to to live by the rules. They're having to animal sacrifice, worship. They've got to go to the temple once a year. They've got to go to the high priest. They've got to get forgiveness of sins, grain offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings, holy garb, sanctified clothing requirements, clean and unclean animals, childbirth purification rites, leprosy, bodily discharges, certain types of dishes and clothing materials that couldn't even be mixed or used in ceremonial law. There's tons. This is what they grew up in. This is all they've known is all this stuff going on. But they really... They didn't understand it. They didn't understand why or what. Well, I don't know. God said to do it, and he said it would make us clear, so that's what we'll do. But they weren't understanding. They really, there's, right? That's where this idolatry comes from. Like, well, I guess if I just use the right dishes, I'll make it to heaven. Boy, wouldn't that be easy? And I'll bet we wouldn't even do that. Well, I don't like glass. I'm going to buy Tupperware anyway. Well, then you're not going to heaven. Like, that would be, that would just, I can just see it. Hebrews 8, 7 through 10. Here's their misunderstanding that the New Testament writers give us. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And in my text here, I have that red and bold and highlighted new covenant. Please, if someone has fed you the lie that Old Testament standards must still be honored, they do not they were a ceremonial law foreshadowing the coming of Christ and what he wants to do in our hearts now. It's clear in black and white here. I will make a new covenant. We cannot have two covenants. One new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Right there, listen, they broke the covenant, so I closed it. They broke it. It's no longer a covenant. They're gone. Right? They adultered. I served them divorce papers. It's closed. We're done with that. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Pastor Phil talked a lot about that last week, about writing it on their hearts. Now, salvation has changed. It's no longer going to the stone tablet to see the requirements, but they're written right here when you're saved now. They're here. You know you understand God's word. Colossians 2, 16 through 23 says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are only a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you die, the increase is from God. Just dwell on that. If, if you increased in your godliness because of your adherence to the law, how many people here would be really getting super great close to Jesus? It'd be a difficult thing, right? Every single day, we'd stumble off the totem pole again. We have to start climbing back up to get closer to him. But according to God, that's where the increase comes from. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things that perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom 
and self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, but they are of how much value against the indulgence of the flesh? A little bit, some, no value, God's word says, no value. Well, that's not fair, but I'm using those to keep myself on the straight and narrow. Well, you're going to trip and fall at some point because they're of no value against the indulgence of the flesh, the word of God says, no value. Then where do we find that value? Well, we find it in the stone of remembrance that we're looking at now. We find that increase from God. The, the disciples at this point, their biggest problem was that they couldn't wrap their minds around the foreshadowing. And instead they applied their works to their righteousness and God's love for them. Look how many works I've done. God loves me the most. I had a gentleman years ago at a home group tell me, would you pray for me? In fact, would you pray for our whole, our whole home group here? Because you're closer to God than I am. And he'll hear your prayers before he'll hear mine. That's not true. That's just not true. He hears your prayers the same time he hears my prayers. And he doesn't care that I'm up here. He just asked me to do this. This is my calling. This is my contribution to the body. I'm not any closer to God. Maybe I spend more time studying than some of you. And I bet some of you outstudy me in a heartbeat. That has nothing to do with how much God loves me. Or here's my prayers. He loved you before you were born while you were yet a sinner and hated him. Amen. And he loved me the same. So they couldn't wrap their minds around it. And what they were doing, what they were being taught, it was making their lives burdensome and impossible. And those are big words. What do you mean? Well, Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So if that's what they were doing, it made their life impossible. Because Hebrews says it is not possible. That, that clo that's the end of that story. We're not going to argue about it. Period. First John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So the fellows here are making their lives burdensome and impossible because they're following commands that were meant to be a foreshadowing of Christ's coming, but they didn't get that yet. So Jesus, through the prophets, has already been giving them the answer. He says, listen, I'm going to come. I'm going to rescue. I'm going to change things. I just need you to believe. I just need you to believe. Galatians 3, 3 through 6. Says, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Who here, who here among us, personally, right now I'm asking you, this is in Scripture, who here went, got out of the Ten Commandments, followed all ten of them, and then the Holy Spirit came upon you and you knew you were saved? Raise your hand right now. I'm going to point you out and say heretic, but if you're bold, do it. <laughs> We're going to argue. You're wrong, because it says so. Listen, the Word says, no, that's not how it's happened. It's not how this happened. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? Oh, praise God that he does not do his miracles through me because of my obedience to the law, because he would never use me. He would, he would just be like, oh, Corey, you're a failure. I've got no use for you in my kingdom. That's what it would sound like. But he does it by the hearing of faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's the third time that verse has come up in the last three weeks. The so group, the youth have been talking about it because Abraham did not believe in God or thought of God. Or it's because Abraham believed God. God, because his life was changed, ultimately his actions, his thoughts, his words, everything he did were surrounded and formed in the fashion of God because he believed God. There's no other prepositional words in there, just he believed. When you say, I believe, that means it changes everything about you. I believe God doesn't want me to get divorced, but I can't reconcile with my partner, so we're going to get divorced. Those two don't go together. You either believe God and his truth, or you don't believe God. And your actions show it. So Jesus sets up communion. To remember, he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. That he will write the commandments on our hearts, right? Jeremiah 31, 33 tells us that. Those who have been diligently teaching the words 
of life to their children and families. I love that in Deuteronomy 4, 6, and 11, like every other chapter, it says it again, teach them to your children, teach them to your children, teach it to your children, teach the words of life to your children over and over and over. And so he says, I'm going to set up a remembrance stone to help you through the process. Because what's going to happen is the tidal waves of life are going to come in. Whoa, whoa, and and you'll be like, where do I throw my anchor? What do I do? He says, I'm going to set up a, a stone for you. And remembering that Christ, I listen. If you're asleep right now, wake up. Listen. Listen right now. Eyes up here just for a minute. Look at me. Listen to me. Remembering that Jesus Christ died for you is the single most important thing that you can remember when you work with Christ. It is the single most important thing, and it is the answer to every test, and it is the best way to process every single situation that comes your way, period. And I will live and die on that hill. I will take you to town on it. Remembering Jesus Christ is the best way to fight against the enemy. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you and me, wretched, filthy sinner. And all of our debauchery and adulteries, he said, I love you and I'm going to die to fix that. Romans 8, 37 through 39 says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing within the framework of God's handiwork that he is in total control of, right? We just add that in. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in our Lord Christ Jesus nothing can separate us. So if we remember he died for us, then what do we have stuff to say? But Romans 8, 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Church, wake up. Who can be against us? Nobody. Nobody. There's not even a speck of malintent in our God's heart for us. Not even a speck. Not one single time did God think, oh, but not you. I hate you. No, but not you. I don't love you. Not you. You haven't followed my works. No, not you. You're not worthy. He's never said that to anybody until that day, until that time. Don't be caught there. So he gives us the process. He says, you can have victory. I'm setting up victory for you. I'm setting up this communion for you to, to look at, to understand. He says, I'm the good teacher, right? Mark 10, gets called the good teacher. And in verse 30, back to our main text for a minute, it says, and then when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That natural outcome of the celebration of Jesus' death for us should be singing, should be joy, should be in love with the Lord. The test comes, he says, hey, remember me first, and let's sing. And we see it in Scripture, Paul and Silas in jail, right? And they're like, oh, let's sing. And the chains fall off, and David would, wrote all these psalms, and sing for the Lord, dancing through the streets and embarrassing my wife. I keep wondering, there's a moment come where I'm going to embarrass my wife, dance through the streets in my undergarments, like, woo, Jesus! Yeah! Right, that was David and Moses. Moses writing these huge songs are coming through the Red Sea and he writes this song down and, and Aaron and Miriam are like, let's sing this, it's gonna be a great song. And his sister writes a song and there's all these songs. This is a natural outcome. But what is the test? It's coming up. Verse 31, back to our main text. Verse 31. And Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But, there's a but, we're not done yet. After I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Oh, Lord, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus just looks at him lovingly. Oh, Peter, assuredly I say to you this night, before the rooster crows, you, you, Peter, you alone, will deny me one, two, three times. Oh, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. The warning of the test, the preparation, the Lord quotes the other prophet Zechariah, right? The, the boy should have seen it coming because they had the Old Testament. They had the prophets. Jesus has been warning them. Things like that are what should have carried them through. Peter specifically, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did he just say? Wait, I've heard that somewhere before. But Zechariah 13, here's what he's quoting. He says, awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. 
And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. That's where we want to find ourselves in that third that's left. He says, the test is coming. I'm telling you how it's going to happen. But listen, I'm going to carry you through. I'm going to refine you as gold. And when you come through, I'm going to say, these are my people. And you're going to say, you're my God. This is the test. We know Romans 5 says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. John 16 tells us, Jesus answered them. He said, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each one to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. All right, this is the answer of Jesus. And he's warning them, right from John 16, it's that same portion that we're looking at in Matthew 26. So listen, it's coming. You're going to get scattered. I'm telling you the test right now, and I'm writing the answers on the board. And what we're going to do is a little activity here. I'm going to set up this remembrance stone that you really don't know anything about yet. And we're going to call it the Last Sub, or we're going to call it Communion. You can get all sorts of fun names. But it's something that you guys are going to use to hang on to. And as we look at some of the other Gospels, we know there's a lot more in the situation. We look at the Gospel of Luke. And at John, and we see that the Lord has these, these plans, these big plans. In fact, what I really love about John's gospel is chapter 13 through 17. Five chapters are the exact same time period as what is only one paragraph in Mark 26 and two paragraphs in Luke and in John, or I'm sorry, in Luke. And there's five chapters in John when they're sitting at the table at the final supper and Jesus gives them all of this stuff going, I'm the true vine, I'm the way of the life, how to pray, the Holy Spirit's going to be sent to you, the gift of peace, joy, how to operate, what it's going to look like. So don't let the one sentence in Matthew 26 throw you off. It wasn't, here you go, here's a communion cup and move on. He said, here's what we're going to do and here's how it's going to work and here's what you're going to hold to. Here's how you can remember me. And he gives them all of this instruction, lots and lots of it. And in John's take of Simon Peter's boldness. John 13, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. I said, well, Lord, I'm, I will follow you anywhere. Believer, we're here this morning to say that. I will follow you anywhere, Lord. But how are we going to do it? What are you going to do when, when the trouble comes? Even though God brought you through like 100 troubles already. If you're sitting here this morning, I know most of you fairly well. I'm just getting to learn more about you. I had a great meeting two weeks ago with someone here in our church, and they told me their whole testimony. I was like, wow, I had no idea the crazy amount of suffering that our God has brought you through. They told me all about their life. I was like, whoa, you're way stronger than I am. I had packed up and gone home. But there was something this person in our church had. They had that remembrance stone. They knew there's no God's brought me through a whole bunch. I'm not scared anymore. We know this, this quick to speak emotional answer from Peter is, is to just, it's simply lacked, based on this lack of understanding, right? He doesn't really understand the process preparation yet. And we see it from the same in everybody at the table, right? In Luke, we actually see at that moment in time, the boys are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Jesus is here like, I'm the true vine. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to do this for you. Hey, James, John, what are you guys talking about over there? Oh, oh, <laughs> nothing, Lord, nothing. None of you are going to be the greatest. I'm the greatest. You're missing this. Like they're at, they're at the communion table arguing about who the greatest is. That's what Luke tells us. That's what he overhears. Like, wow. Can you imagine? Such a misunderstanding. Jesus is at this spa. He says, listen, I'm, I'm proclaiming my death, my resurrection. These are the answer. But of course, he's looking really right to Peter. This laser focus on Peter. He says, Peter, you're going to be my example. He says, Peter, there's a reason and a hope. I am bringing you through a test. 
It's going to be a good test. But Peter, when you're done, there's going to be such good coming from it. In Luke 22, it tells us, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. I love that we see Jesus' control of all things here. He says, Satan came and asked me, guess what? I gave him permission, but, but wait, Peter, Peter said, what? Wait, listen, Peter, wait, but I prayed for you. And I sit at the right hand of the father. That's where I'm headed. So you can't fail. I pray that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So he tells them that you're going to return. It's going to happen, but I'm going to let the enemy come to you. And I'm going to let him mess with you. I'm going to let him throw waves over you. I'm going to let him knock down that house you built on the sand. Because right now you're in that house. Like the three little pigs, you got like straw and hay stubble. You're living in there. You're like, I got this. No big bad wolf can get me. I'll go with you wherever you need, Jesus. He's like, no, not tonight, Peter. Not tonight. Tonight we're going to blow that house of straw over. And we're going to start digging until we hit the rock, me. And then we're going to build there. And even his answer then, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you deny me three times. He says, I'm prepping you. I'm praying for you. I have a plan for you. And when you return, and you will return, Peter, when you realize the answer was written on the board and you start looking at the process, you I, I goofed that one up. He says, good. Peter, now I want you to look at the real answer. I provided the process for you. I'm going to talk about my communion. I'm going to show you that my blood, my death, my resurrection are how you are going to overcome this world. I am your remembrance stone. And I'm going to close on this. All I could think of one of those verses I love. And in Mark 4, there's this spot. And I heard someone say it in a sermon years ago. And it's always struck me. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. So Jesus starts, just stop right there. Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. Meaning Jesus said, we're going to get to the other side. It's going to happen. We're headed there. I'm going to make it happen. Don't worry about it. All right, no problem. They hop in the boat, right? And hopefully you know the story. A great windstorm arises. And they're like, what? Jesus, wake up. We're perishing. He's like, oh. Oh, ye of little faith, calm down. And that's it. And then over to the other side. But when they hit that storm, right? When they hit the storm, that misunderstanding. Jesus said, you're going to make it to the other side. I have need to get over there. That's where I'm going. If I'm going there and you're following me, guess where you're going to make it? To the other side. Period. And so he sets up communion. When the trouble comes, believer, you remember his death for our sins. Worship team, come on up. Next week, we're going to talk about a willing spirit and a weak flesh. If you have not done communion with us before, Jasmine's going to lead us in a song. It's time of reflection to remember that stone of who Christ is, that rock, that solid spot. Pray. Pray the Lord. Ask him to forgive you for the places and times in your life, in our lives, where we're, we're just stumbling, where, where we forget all about his death. What are you going to do, Lord? The storms come upon our tiny boat. Ask for forgiveness. Prepare your heart. If you're a believer, communion is for you. Believer, the word is very clear. If you have come here and you have something against a brother or sister and they have it against you, don't take communion this morning. Spend your 15 minutes right now praying for that forgiveness. And if you have to get up and leave, go get in your car and leave and go find them and go work on those reparations right now. You are welcome to do that. And not only will you not be judged, but you will have such a peace in your heart because that is what God tells us to do. If you're not a believer this morning, please don't take communion. Just sit with us and enjoy God's presence because it's not for you. And if you'd like to know the Lord Jesus, we'd be happy to talk with you after service and let you know. Feel free to pray out in between the songs as well. And we're happy to come pray for you. Lay hands on you, anoint you with oil if you need it.